Hello and welcome. This is Navy Chat number two. Again, we are joined by Justin, and today we will talk about the U.S. assessment of Japanese air power in the interwar years. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here again. Uh, before the questions, I guess um, I'll add a quick note to avoid any confusion. So uh, Japan did not have an independent air force throughout the interwar period and the Second World War, nor did it have a single air service. It had two. The Imperial Japanese Army Air Service, IJAAS, and the Imperial Japanese Navy Air Service, IJNAS, uh, both were subordinated to their respective armed services. So just to avoid any um, confusion. Let's jump right into the questions. Since in our last Navy chat we outlined what sources were used for getting information on the Imperial Japanese Navy, was there any difference for the Japanese air services or can we just refer to the first Navy chat here? Uh, the sources were broadly similar, but the level of reliance on specific sources over others uh, was different, particularly in the 1920s. So for the most part, yeah, as far as listing the, the kinds of sources they used, you can refer to the, the first Navy chat. Okay, what were the main problems the U.S. faced while trying to get intelligence? And were they any different from the assessment of the naval power? Uh, as with American efforts to assess the capability of the IJN, uh, the main problem faced by the Americans when trying to gather information on the Japanese air services from 1930 onward, which is important, uh, was intense Japanese secrecy. This, however, was not the case in the 1920s. Uh, Japanese... Uh, this Japanese secrecy, once it started to um, come to the forefront, was compounded in the mid to late 1930s by what I would classify as something close to a, a revolution in military affairs, to use the political science buzzword, uh, in regards to military aviation and naval aviation in particular. In your thesis, you covered the U.S. intelligence assessment of Japanese air power in three separate chapters, while you covered the U.S. intelligence assessment of the Japanese naval power only in one chapter. I assume this is due to the greater dynamics in comparison to the naval aspect. Is this correct? And if so, what were the major difference between the air power and the naval assessment? Oh uh, yeah, no, I'm having flashbacks to my defense because they asked the exact same question. Um, as I mentioned in the, the last video, uh, the IJN was slightly more open in the 1920s versus the mid to late 1930s, but uh, overall the level of access and by extension the quality of American assessments throughout the interwar period uh, were mitigated. So, in short, American intelligence assessments of the Japanese Navy transitioned from kind of mitigated to slightly below mitigated over the course of the interwar period. Uh, of course, economic and industrial s assessments remained consistently excellent. So, uh, there wasn't like a lot of change on the Navy side. Uh, American intelligence assessments of Japanese air power, however, was a very different and, in my opinion, uh, more interesting story. The Americans began in the 1920s with a near-perfect assessment at all levels. So everything from industrial capacity to tactics and technology. They were much higher quality assessments than the Americans ever had for the Navy. Uh, why was this the case? Well, the Japanese were new to the air power game. Uh, therefore, they were heavily dependent on foreign assistance. Western aviation experts, uh, both military and civilian, assisted the Japanese with everything from setting up aircraft production to maintaining engines to aerial tactics everything. Uh, all Japanese military aircraft in service in the 1920s were either Western designs that were purchased abroad and assembled in Japan or were produced under license in Japan itself. Therefore, the Americans didn't even need to go to Japanese sources in order to accurately track what the Japanese air services were doing. Uh, they could just ask Western aviation experts that had been brought in to assist the Japanese. Uh, if they wanted to know what aircraft the Japanese were using, they could look at the exact technical specifications because, of, of course, they were, you know, export models or were otherwise Western designed and therefore all that information was pretty easy to find. Additionally, Japanese information security was extremely lax in the 1920s, so uh, tours of air stations, factories, and flight schools were common, lengthy, and informative. Um, <laughs> Heck, even the, the American naval attaché regularly exchanged letters with the Japanese Navy Ministry and would just flat out ask questions about the uh, Japanese Naval Air Service. Um, and the Navy Ministry would reply back in full. It would just be, I, I found some of these letters and it was like, Hi, this is the American naval attaché. Question, 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 question. And then you'd get a reply from the Navy Ministry and they would just answer them. Uh, it was very, very 
Interesting. Then the American Naval Attaché would check the Navy Ministry's answers against the detailed reports of air station and factory tours to see if uh, the Navy Ministry was telling the truth or not, and they were telling the truth. So basically, uh -oh. they, they have full access and also could always double check if the information given was correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, this was an intelligence community's wet dream. Uh, they, they it, Japan on the naval air power and uh, or air power generally uh, side was an open book pretty much. Like, it, it, you couldn't get intelligence better than this uh, in in our physical reality. <laughs> Uh, however, starting in 1930, several changes occurred. Uh, Japanese secrecy began to increase exponentially, of course, by this point the Japanese were becoming increasingly paranoid of the West, uh, while the Japanese air services began to wean themselves off of their dependence on foreign assistance. So at the exact same time that the Japanese are getting more secretive, their, their air services are exponentially increasing in quality. Uh, for the IJNAS, uh, this change was brought on primarily by the 1930 London Naval Treaty, which I consider to be one of the pivotal events in Japanese history. And for the IJAAS, it was the invasion of Manchuria in 1931, uh, of course br bringing with it a huge um, land border with the Soviet Union. Uh, and they made the, finally made the decision to greatly increase the quality and quantity of their air services uh, with the Soviet, fighting the Soviet Union in mind. The end result was a dramatic drop in access given to the Americans, while the Japanese themselves were beginning to take their first major steps into indigenous tact uh, technological and tactical innovation. Uh, once the war in China began, the limited access Westerners had in the early and mid-1930s ended almost entirely. And at this point, Japan had developed fully independent and qualitatively first-rate uh, air power under the noses of foreign observers. Uh, so why didn't the... Americans notice? Well, because the intense secrecy fed into American preconceptions of Japanese unoriginality and numerous quali uh, and the numerous qualitative struggles that the Americans had observed throughout the 1920s when Japanese air power was still in its relative infancy. So in short, uh, the Anglo-American intelligence community developed a bad case of confirmation bias. Uh, any report that repeated the old criticisms of Japanese air power from the 1920s, uh, specifically those pointing to a lack of technical and tactical innovation, were passed on and accepted wholeheartedly, while reports that contradicted this view, which were still well, were pretty uncommon, but did appear with increasing frequency toward the late 1930s, uh, were kind of drowned out by the constant assertion that Japan couldn't design its own aircraft or develop its own aerial tactics. So, basically... Japan started really bad and everyone thought they would continue on a linear path of improvement but at the same time they started to increase exponentially and also basically shut off everything so in a way well the West was left in the dark yeah it was, um, you know over a 20 year span you went from somebody that was totally reliant I mean there's a British aviation mission to help the Japanese Naval Air Service get off the ground, uh, pun intended. And there was a French aviation mission uh, to do pretty much the same thing with the Japanese Army Air Service. Uh, they were just mass importing aircraft. They were. Uh, there's one favorite photograph I have, you can find it on Wikipedia actually, um, of Admiral Togo, the guy who won uh, the battle at Tsushima against the Russians, and he's just being shown an airplane by uh, uh, the head of the British mission, and he just has this like look of wonderment on his face. Uh, it's kind of great. Uh, but yeah, so they went from that kind of dependency all the way through to, you know, the early 1930s, they start to move away from copying Western practices. And then in the late 1930s, uh, mid to late 1930s, they transition fully into developing their own equipment and developing their own aerial tactics and they improved significantly of course they got a lot of combat experience in china and at that point the western observers couldn't really see what was going on so which kind of brings us to the next question what were the main goals of the u.s intelligence assessment of japanese air power and did they change due to this change in secrecy uh no they remained consistent so the main focus was always remained on you know quote kind of big picture capability. Uh, so how fast could the Japanese mass-produce aircraft? How were their pilot training programs? How large was their personnel reserve? 
Uh, how large was their aircraft reserve? Uh, did the Japanese have the raw materials necessary to maintain the production of aircraft over a prolonged period of time, particularly if they were you know, being blockaded or whatever? Uh, did they have enough aviation fuel to continue to power those aircraft if they were cut off from external sources, you know, etc. So in short, the Americans wanted to assess if the Japanese could successfully fight the U.S. in a high-intensity attritional air war, and of course the answer was a resounding no. Uh, tactical and technical minutia did concern uh, American observers, but it kind of took a back seat to these larger issues. It can be tempting in air power history, uh, particularly in enthusiast circles, to obsess over technology. To fixate on those kinds of issues is uh, not just missing the forest for the trees, it's missing the trees for the leaves. Uh, American observers were were constantly, you know, they emphasized very strongly the, the big picture, that Japan, in a protracted air war against the United States, was going to get crushed. So basically, they were always focusing on the grand strategy and strategy of the whole of a potential war. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, um, air war, at least in, you know, in Second World War, it was largely a numbers game. Let's tackle another topic which is quite important nowadays or is probably also a little bit misunderstood. You write about racism and ethnocentrism. Could you expand a bit what those are nowadays and what they actually mean now in academia or at least for a historian uh oh god the elephant in the room uh, uh the traditional view of american intelligence assessments of the japanese uh, of this period uh, was that the americans were racist and therefore their assessments were awful because they kind of allowed their prejudice to blind them uh, this is really a, a gross oversimplification so one could say not everything is racist and probably also not everything is sexist although this doesn't really cover the topic uh, no. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was the older historiography was quite single-minded uh, in their focus on, uh, and, it, and it seems like they they didn't do enough reading of the actual primary sources because uh, there was very little racism in American assessments of Japanese air or naval power. Uh, when racism or ethnocentrism did appear, it typically only did so in the language of the report, but not its substance. So, what do I mean by that? Well. Um, very often I would find accurate observations, but they were coined in racist or ethnocentric language. But their conclusions were not informed by those beliefs. So maybe they would throw like a racial epithet or something like that into it. But the actual point that the person was trying to make was accurate and was based on solid observations. Uh, and there was no difference between the way Americans assessed the Japanese and the way they assessed European forces. Uh, it's not like they had some kind of different standard by which uh, the intelligence agencies judged their potential arrivals. Uh, if racism or ethnocentrism were the driving force behind American assessments, then an assessment of Japanese air power from 1923 should have been just as badly flawed as one from 1940, uh, yet that was not the case. Uh, Japanese secrecy was always the primary issue from uh, the early 1930s onward. Uh, and this, the less reliable information the Americans had access to, the more they would fill the gaps with you know, dated negative assessments from the 1920s and some ethnocentrism and uh, ideas of national characteristics. Uh, when they did have multiple, uh, a multitude of reliable information, their assessments tended to be accurate. So uh, when they started relying on things more like open sources, uh, like books and magazines, uh, those were notably more racist. Uh, but classified sources never really stooped to those lows. As for uh, national characteristics, uh, which I mentioned before, that's actually a term they used at the time. It's not something I came up with or scholars later came up with. Uh, they were used liberally by pretty much everyone during this period, and it was something entirely different from uh, simple racism. Uh, which, of course, racism is you are making judgments on a, a a person because of you know physical attributes like the color of their skin or the the shape of their eyes or the color of their hair that kind of thing uh national characteristics was something bigger it was uh, essentially stereotypes based on nationality so for example uh the japanese were believed to lack initiative uh, as a people the italians were considered to uh, possess sloth and a lack of martial spirit uh, the Germans were believed to have Teutonic efficiency, 
uh, etc. So as the scholar uh, Greg Kennedy notes, uh, these national characteristics were no different from stereotypes that were applied to the Japanese, even though they were uh, they were national characteristics applied to white people. Now, you mentioned that the secrecy got increased over time, but the U.S. intelligence probably had a certain degree of information from the Second Sino-Japanese War, especially because there were some U.S. volunteers, the so-called Flying Tigers, active in this war. Mm -hmm. So the, the reports uh, regarding the Japanese air services that came out of China uh, once the Second Sino-Japanese War began, uh, July 37, uh, were by far the best the Americans got in the late 1930s and through to 1941. However, they were typically ignored, uh, downplayed, or drowned out by the mass of reports which simply reiterated uh, old tropes of Japanese unoriginality. Uh, the Americans held the Republic of China Air Force in very low esteem, uh, obviously, you know, justifiably for the most part. Uh, this led to uh, at, at most indifferent and at worst dismissive response to Chinese assessments of Japanese capability, uh, despite the fact that there are few reports from uh, China that, that were talking to Chinese pilots and things like that uh, were excellent. Uh, reports from China generally were quite rare. Uh, most of the fighting after 1937 took place away from Western eyes, uh, and the naval and military attaches back in Tokyo seemed content to just translate Japanese press releases of the war and send them back to Washington, D.C., uh, often without even any analysis at all. Uh, it, it was a similar deal with the Flying Tigers. Uh, the preconceptions of Japanese unoriginality and inability to innovate technologically led to the dismissal of the bulk of uh, Chenault's reporting. Uh, I should explain that when you're looking at intelligence reports, uh, you have to look through thousands of the darn things. Uh, it can be hard to comprehend why information like that provided by Chenault or uh, technical data gathered by flying captured Japanese aircraft uh, that they got in China uh, was overlooked uh, when you fixate only on those assessments. Uh, you don't understand why this stuff was buried until you discover that for every report saying the Japanese were good or that they were designing first-rate indigenous aircraft, uh, there was a dozen or more which were stuck mentally in the 1920s uh, where the Japanese couldn't design their own aircraft and they had lots of other problems. So what do you believe as an American officer back in Washington, D.C.? Do you believe the one report that says the Japanese air services are good or the two dozen reports that say they're second-rate? Uh, keeping in mind that back when your knowledge of the Japanese air services was excellent in the 1920s, uh, they weren't very good air forces. This is kind of interesting. So they were basically stuck. But what would be interesting, I mean, there were the Flying Tigers. And did was there any systematic questioning of this group or one of their officers? I mean, before the war or at least during the Second World War when they realized, okay, we are now fighting the Japanese? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I know before the war, from anything I've seen, um, uh, Chenault, the commander, nominal commander, um, he was sending all, and his reporting actually generally was great, and a lot of the reporting from the Flying Tigers, because these, these are the guys that were actually fighting the Japanese uh, Army Air Service. Uh, and they were they were developing aerial tactics, uh, you know, boom and zoom energy fighting uh, that uh, was working against Japanese aircraft. They were saying, hey, the Japanese are actually pretty good. Uh, we've captured certain Japanese aircraft. Uh, the Chinese have been testing them and they're pretty good and they're indigenous. And they're sending all of this reporting back. And it was met with pretty much indifference, uh, and sometimes contempt. Uh, back stateside. It was one of those situations where the further away uh, somebody was from the Japanese air services, the lower their opinion got. Um, as far as during the war, I'm not sure, because obviously my research pretty much ended with uh, the start of the war. Uh, I I want to say from memory, I could be incorrect, but they, I think there was a, a bit more effort and uh, to disseminate inform accurate information regarding the air services after they'd already been kicked in the balls at the start of the war, and realized they were a lot better than the um, than they had thought. Well, and overall, I mean, since there was quite some errors made, but would you consider that the American intelligence gathering was successful? Um, yes and no. So. <clears throat> 
Again, the, the, the strategic, industrial, and economic assessments were consistently accurate, and of course they mattered most. Uh, the quality or uh, effectiveness of an individual aircraft or tactic is nearly irrelevant if the system uh, they operate within is fundamentally weak. So it's like, you know, uh, you design a first-rate aircraft, you know, congratulations, do you want a cookie? You know, can you produce 10,000 of them now and then also train competent pilots to fly them? Like, that that's the, the part of the air war that the Americans uh, fully understood, and they had a very accurate appreciation of Japanese capabilities. But of course, on the other hand, they really badly screwed up uh, tactical and technological capability. Could you expand a bit on this? Okay. Um, yeah, the, the American intelligence assessments of tactical and technological capability for the Japanese air services was disastrously poor uh, by 1941. It was a, de a decline from excellence to ignorance from 1920 to 1941 regarding the kinds of aircraft pilots the British and Americans would find themselves fighting. And of course the result was bewilderment, shock, and embarrassment. Uh, for example, the, you know, the British were genuinely surprised that the Japanese had a fighter in service with a retractable landing gear, uh, and this is late 1941. Uh, while I don't believe an accurate assessment of the Japanese air services would have prevented the early defeats, uh, it certainly would have helped to alleviate the shock and, of course, a uh, dissemination of accurate technical and tactical information on the air services certainly would have helped uh, American, and British, and Dutch aviators uh, at the start of the war. Uh, the problem with Japanese aviation was never innovation from 1934 to 1945. This is something even historians uh, can get wrong. Uh, even today. Uh, it was the industrial and economic weaknesses that the Americans had stressed uh, as much as they did Japan's inability to innovate. So the, the Japanese could design and put a competitive aircraft into service, and they did so throughout the war, but it was just, they were doing so in numbers that were too small to matter. You know, they design something great, and then they build 400 of them, and that's not going to make any operational impact. You know, that's like more a, a tactical footnote, you know, where American pilots might actually stumble on aircraft that were roughly equivalent to them or maybe even slightly superior, but it was, you know, one small tactical engagement in one small campaign that was, you know, it wasn't going to make a huge impact. Uh, the main failure was the Americans assumed that they, at the start of the war, they would have a decisive technological and tactical advantage when in fact none existed. Mm, yeah, that explains a lot, the early defeats and also the shock the Americans had in the beginning, yeah. Mm. Because basically every every information was, was wrong and they were fighting a, an enemy that was not, that they want to expect. And it, uh, probably a little bit similar to what the, the Battle of Britain happened when the Germans assessed the number of production completely wrong for the British and then basically at, at the third or fourth month they were basically fighting planes that weren't there in their intelligence assessments because they couldn't be there. So they were basically fighting ghost planes and, and thinking the fighter command was on the last leg. Oh, yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, and it's like kind of um, uh, the, the shock from from underestimating the Japanese air services. I mean, it's still around. It's it's kind of uh, tapered off in recent years, but for the historiography, for like years after the war, the Japanese air services, they were these, you know, 10 foot tall super giants that were amazingly awesome at everything. And every aircraft they had was best in class and their pilots were superhumans. And it was kind of a similar thing with the history, early historiography of the Wehrmacht, where, you know, like, the, like, France and Britain, all that they get their ass kicked early on, and that shock kind of, you know, oh, the Germans are obviously perfect, and so uh, you know the historiography for years and years after the war was just constantly praising about how the Wehrmacht, Wehrmacht could do no wrong, uh, and it was the same deal with the the Japanese air services, and it took a long time for people to get a more balanced and realistic view. You know, that's why I'm very careful in the language of my thesis to um, say, you know, these Japanese air services there. They were good. They were first-rate qualitatively, in my view. But that doesn't mean everything they had was the best ever. You know, some stuff they had was best in class. Some stuff they had was, you know, kind of workhorse, average stuff. And they produced lemons, like every every air power. You know, once sometimes you just produced an aircraft that was not all that great. So yeah, that's kind of an enduring legacy of this intelligence failure. From what I read in your thesis, the Japanese air service made huge leaps in a few years. <laughs> 
Was this radical improvement comprehensible from outside or is our perspective viewed by hindsight and a bit strict? Uh, yeah, uh, as, I meant, uh, as I mentioned before, the capabilities of air power generally exploded uh, in the 1930s. You know, you still had painfully slow biplanes with you know, small pay payloads and stuff, some of which was designed in the early uh, mid-1920s in frontline service in the early 1930s. Then in the mid-1930s, there was an explosion in monoplane and significantly improved biplane designs you know, with vastly improved capability. Then again, in the late 1930s, there was yet another quantum leap uh, in capability, all within, you know, short 10 years. Uh, the evidence of Japanese advances were there, uh, but American observers failed to see them due to their own preconceptions. Uh, so you had a farcical situation where tech detailed technical reports of excellent Japanese aircraft, uh, like the B-5N carrier attack aircraft, coexisted with reports that stated the Japanese didn't have a single indigenously designed aircraft service. Uh, you had another instance where the Americans were trying to determine the origin of the G3M medium bomber, uh, and no one suggested the possibility that it was Japanese designed. Uh, in fact, the Americans wrote contradictory reports. Uh, one said it was obviously a copy of a Heinkel design. Uh, another one said it was stolen from Junkers. Uh, couldn't even agree on which German aircraft company or aircraft the Japanese had copied their design from. Um, the only point the reports agreed on was that the G3M had to be a copy of something. Uh, of course, the G3M actually wasn't. It was an indigenous Japanese design. Uh, so, well, one must be careful not to be too damning. Uh, I feel it is fair to level a significant amount of criticism at assessments in the late 1930s and into 1941, uh, which were increasingly divorced from reality. Um, I think really overall, uh, to summarize American intelligence assessments of Japanese air and naval power uh, from 1920 to 1941, uh, uh, the final sentence of my thesis kind of works pretty well. Um, uh, so in, the, um, in their haste to predict, to predict the setting of the sun, the Americans failed to appreciate the danger of its rise. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.